Hello everybody and welcome to um, our journey through the Cthulhu Mythos. Um, and today we are on the granddaddy of them all, um, H.P. Lovecraft's seminal work, The Call of Cthulhu. Um, this, I believe, was written in 26, and it wasn't published until February 28, um, in Weird Tales, and, um, originally Farnsworth Wright didn't want it, and then, um, oh, not August Derleth, but the other guy from Arkham House, um, Wandry? Is that how you say his name? Um, he uh, told Farnsworth Wright that he was going to sell it somewhere else. And so um, Wright asked for it back. Um, but um, this is kind of an important piece here. This is the first time we ever hear of Cthulhu. Um, and... Cthulhu itself has, like, taken over pop culture. And, um, a lot of people probably don't know or understand the origins of where it came from. And the, probably the most important thing here is pretty much like scholars and um, people like that who dig into Lovecraft. Like everything kind of goes into a before Call of Cthulhu and after Call of Cthulhu. And it actually situates on after he moved from, um, he lived in New York for a while um, when he was married and then moved to back to Providence. And when he moved back to Providence, that's when, um, his new stuff started taking shape. Um, he had been working on, um, his essay, uh, supernatural horror and literature, which might have, be a reason why the stories at this point are so good. Um, the one story he wrote before this, when back in Providence, was um, Cool Air. And we'll talk about that um, at a later date when we're just talking more about Lovecraft stuff. Um, we're just kind of focusing on mythos stuff right now. But um, <clears throat> everything after this has a completely different feel and you could probably look back to his earlier stories and connect an earlier story with one of his later stories so for instance a lot of people look at Dagon as just a um practice run at Call of Cthulhu, which it might have been. Like, he might have inspired himself in that way. Um, but as we go through the rest of these tales, those things are going to pop up a lot more. Um, not necessarily recycling of ideas, but looking at a first attempt at achieving something. I don't necessarily think um, Lovecraft was ever um, hung up on the stories he was telling as much as he was hung up on how that story left you feeling, um, how well that story portrayed his view of cosmic horror which is the first point of what we're going to talk about right now. Um, in one of my other Cthulhu Mythos videos, um, I got a comment 
and I think it was from Jason, um, it Jason, Jason's Weird Reads, um, and we were talking about how whether or not H.P. Lovecraft invented cosmic horror, he took it to a level that had never been taken to before or since, um, you could say. And um, the thing that a lot of people have a habit of doing when getting into cosmic horror, like writers, um, is entangling parts of the Cthulhu mythos in cosmic horror. And you don't need to do that. Like, you can write a thousand cosmic horror stories and not have anything Lovecraftian in them at all. Um, there is... And so, like, when people say, like, what is cosmic horror? <clears throat> if you take the actual opening lines of this story, not the quote from Blackwood and not the these papers were found. Um, if you take the actual opening line of this story, that is exactly what cosmic horror is. And if you read that chunk, you should be able to um, fall down a abyss of hell and shit to be able to get that feeling. So, um, I am going to read that, those two, first two sentences to you. The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. That's it. That's what cosmic horror is. Right there. That's all there is to it. Like, we are blessed, if you will, that we cannot see everything that's around us right now. We could only see in the dimensions that we can see in. We could only hear sounds from this range to this range. There are things that we cannot do. And if we were able to see past the um, dimensions that we could see, if we could hear the lows and the highs um, that we cannot hear, we would probably go insane. And our ignorance is kind of a blessing. Like, when it talks about the ignorance being um, the placid island on Black Seas of Infinity, like, on the island, we're safe. You know, like, going out into those waters is what would be dangerous for us. So not knowing things, not being able to comprehend things that are out there are the only things that are keeping us sane, if that makes sense. That right there, like if you just read those two sentences and then walked away and never read any more Lovecraft or, or the rest of Call of Cthulhu or anything like that, and you understood those two sentences the way Lovecraft intended for you to understand them, that's all, like, Lovecraft would be happy. Like, you understood his thesis and everything he was about. We are nothing compared to the universe. We are nothing compared to the things that came before us and that will probably come after us. We are completely insignificant. And if that doesn't cause you to shudder, then you have to start looking at yourself and figuring out what the hell is wrong with you. So anyway, so that was my first point. The second point here is um, something that was really popular in the late 90s and early 2000s um, in horror, which was um, the found footage film, like from Blair Witch Project, 
uh, paranormal activity. Um, there's a million of them. I don't know why I'm not thinking of any more right now. But um, yeah. that was like a really, really big, profitable subgenre. And those weren't the first movies to do that. Like, I, there's probably some before it, but I always look at Cannibal Holocaust as the first, like, found footage movie. Um, but in horror literature, um, they didn't necessarily have footage, but almost everything was found. And whether it be um, a suicide note which is what the whole story is, um, or uh, Dracula. It's very epistolary. Like, it's just journal entries, newspaper reports, um, recordings. Um, even Frankenstein, with the um, letters sent back home, um, as, like, the beginning and the end um, of everything. Um... So this is kind of like a old timey way of kind of telling a story. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that if, even though people were writing fiction, if they put in like, oh, in this newspaper, it said blah, 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 blah. It adds credibility to the story, even though the person reading it should know that the story is fictional. Um, and I was just doing a video the other day talking about how tired of epistolary fiction I am. Like, I'm not a judge. This isn't a court of law. I don't need evidence. I just want a story. Lovecraft was very big on collecting evidence, if you will, to tell a story. And in Call of Cthulhu, one of the first things he says in it is what was driving some people crazy was collecting the evidence and then putting that evidence together to paint the bigger picture. And when you do that, that's when you realize um, kind of how effed you are, if that makes sense. So this story, that was a big preamble to get to where we're going here. But I just need you to understand that the cosmic horror element of this and pretty much everything else Lovecraft writes, that is the focal point. All these other characters, all these gods, um, all the great ones, all of these things, those are so secondary to the focus of human life being insignificant. Okay? This story opens up with this dude who gets his, um, his uncle. His uncle dies and doesn't have any kids. And so he leaves all this stuff um, to his nephew to kind of take care of or whatever. Um, and amongst all these things was a box that was locked. And he didn't think much of it, but he felt that was more personal, so he didn't give that to the university and all this other stuff. Um, and so he opens it up, and there's all sorts of stuff in it. There's... Um, newspaper clippings, there's um, folders um, that state different things, um, and then there's something in it called um, a bass relief, or baz relief, and it's basically a coin um, where a relief, I had to look this up because I don't know what relief is, but a relief is when you sculpt something out of something and then leave that other thing behind it kind of thing. So like an, a coin being like printed on, that is what that is kind of thing, if that makes sense. Um, and the, I'm going to just call it a coin for the rest of the time here. Um, so the coin had this, um, he compares it to a squid dragon man. Um, if you could mix all those things together. Um, 
And through all of these um, newspaper articles, and it's funny that it's March right now because all of this stuff takes place in March. Um, well, at least this first bit. Um, all throughout the world, really, in 1925, according to these newspaper clippings, all this crazy crap was going on. Like, earthquakes where there shouldn't be earthquakes. People going mad and killing their family. Um, cults um, disrupting villages. Uh, people getting ready for some cataclysmic event that never comes and all this stuff and all of this stuff in here that Lovecraft mentions and I think there was a painting that um, drove people crazy and caused a riot in France or something like that um, all of this stuff apparently really happened and um, if you were to look up all the stuff that he brings up in this in between like February 22nd, 1925 through April 2nd, 1925, all of these things actually did take place. And um, so Lovecraft, being the storyteller that he is, is trying to insinuate that all these things are happening as um, kind of a coming of something, which we will find out what that is in a little bit. Well, so this guy, the guy that died... Um, he decides that um, he's going to start digging into this a little bit more. Long story short, there's this artist that has been having like ridiculous vivid dreams about all sorts of things and um, that are monstrous, hideous, ridiculous stuff. And in one of these like fever dreams, he sculpted the coin. And... Um, as soon as, um, after April 2nd or whatever, um, his fever that wasn't really a fever subsided and his dreams were just normal and nothing clever was coming out of the guy anymore. And, um, so this first chapter is just talking about the situations that are happening in order to get us to the second chapter, which is Legrasse's um, stuff, which we'll talk about next week. But um, if you just want to drive yourself crazy for the next week, just ponder the fact that um, human existence is like completely insignificant and there are far greater things that we should fear if we even knew they were there. Um, as we get deeper into Lovecraft stuff, there's stories where um, you can see like what's like right next to you normally. Like right now, you could be sitting there, and there could be thousands of like demonic creatures yelling and screaming like an inch away from your face but like because we can't see that plane and we can't hear that decibel range we don't know about it so um if that doesn't give you nightmares tonight i don't know what will so um if you haven't read call of cthulhu yet the first chapter is on weirdmass.com you go there and take a look at it and um other than that i will talk to you guys later Bye bye